uh, very much welcome to the uh, second of the fall series of Laffey uh, lectures uh, um, uh, and uh, the online uh, lectures. Um, CLAPI, if you don't know, is a center at UCLA. It stands for the Center for the Liberal Arts and Free Institutions. And uh, uh, in addition to serving students in as many ways as we can, we, uh, um, uh, we, we put on these public events. And uh, uh, it's a shame that I'm a person. But on the other hand, uh, one advantage of it is that uh, uh, I know some of you are from very far away places and it's uh, very, very delightful to have you with us. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the next and last of the lectures in the series uh, will be two weeks from tonight. Um, and uh, I think uh, the lecture is at the same time. Uh, the lecturer will be none other than Calvin Normore, who's with us tonight. Uh, who, as he just mentioned, is uh, in Australia. Uh, so because of, it's because of the time zone difference, if you're in his seminar, uh, that will be at a different time. But the lecture, I think, is at the same time as usual. Um, and uh, his lecture will be entitled uh, the very, uh, A Very Short History of uh, Natural Rights. So uh, that should be um, uh, very, very interesting, I think. Uh, 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 just to, I mentioned seminars. Our format is that we have a, uh, uh, a lecturer, usually it's on Thursday night, uh, with time differences and everything. These times sometimes vary. Uh, usually the lecture is on Thursday night, and then usually the seminar is Saturday morning. But again, that may uh, Calvin's, for example, is going to be in the afternoon. Um, and uh, the seminars are a nice chance to be in a smaller group and to uh, get to know the visitor and others uh, a little more intimately, have a more, um, uh, you know, it just in a, you know, intense discussion or, uh, uh, of uh, whatever it is that we're looking at. Um, so uh, if, you, if you are, most of you, I suppose, are, are here because you're on our distribution list, but if you're not, um, uh, let me see if I can get to, uh, I don't know, let me just, there. Um, uh, if you're not on the distribution list, uh, uh, you just go to my email, uh, which is there, Lowenstein at law.ucla, and uh, I'll be glad to put you on. If you want to just get general information about CLAFI, including uh, upcoming events, uh, that's uh, that's a link to the to the web page, the events page. Uh, there's other information there that might be interesting, uh, including very important information on how you could make a contribution to Claffy if you're so inclined. I think that um, there are a number of students on tonight, so I, I and I'm very particularly well, you know, particularly want to welcome uh, the students. And uh, so uh, we have a, a very good Claffy student club. Uh, and the uh, president of it this term or this year is uh, Ishani Desai. And so I'd like Ishani just to take a minute or so uh, to talk to the students about the club. Uh, beg everybody else's indulgence. Ishani. Yes. Um, hello. Uh, like Professor Lowenstein said, my name's Ishani. I'm going to just share my screen really quick to show you guys some information about us. Um, I'm a history major. I am also double minoring in public affairs and professional writing. And, okay, there we go. And so um, I am also a transfer student and I came here last year. I joined Claffy just because I wanted sort of a community here at UCLA um, for like-minded students who love the humanities and liberal arts and want to discuss them. And that is exactly what we do, as you can see, according to our screen. So if you're a student and you're interested in joining us or at least finding out more about our events, um, I have a QR code here, which you just have to scan on your phone in order to subscribe to our mailing list. And it'll probably just be a once a week update of what we're up to and all of that. Um, yeah, but you know, please feel free to reach out to my email or the Claffy email um, and you can be in touch and we can talk about what more uh, if you want to be involved. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now uh, let's turn to uh, the reason we're here tonight, uh, 
uh, uh, which is to hear from uh, Teo Ruiz. Uh, I, I'm meeting Teo Te actually for the first time uh, tonight, but I'm hoping that it will bloom into uh, uh, a great friendship. Um, uh, his office is really, you know, when we have offices, his office is far from mine. Um, uh, but I've heard a lot about Teo, and I've heard about him from the best possible source, which is uh, students. Uh, and uh, they, the students that I've talked to, they just rave about Teo's courses and his teaching. And uh, uh, if you know, for the social scientists among us who dismiss that as uh, anecdotal, um, uh, he has uh, been a recipient of the uh, university's uh, Distinguished Teaching Award, which is as good as it gets in teaching uh, uh, at UCLA. He also, uh, and this is perhaps even more impressive, uh, uh, in 2012, he received the uh, National Humanities Medal uh, from President Obama for, quote, inspired teaching and writing. So uh, uh, he doesn't just teach, he's a scholar too. Uh, his books include one called uh, Spanish Society, 1348 to 1700, uh, The Terror of History, uh, uh, and uh, Crisis and Community, colon, uh, Land and Town in Late Medieval Castile. So uh, I really am uh, just uh, thrilled to be able to uh, uh, you know, uh, Okay, so let's begin. Uh, I have a very strange name. I, first of all, many thanks for inviting me. I am delighted. I went wandering into the other screens. There are like four or five further screens, and I saw many friends and many students. So many thanks. It's beyond the call of duty on a Thursday to be here. My name is a very difficult name. It's a Greek name. It's Theophilo, which means love of God. And all my students call me Theo, which means God. And by all means, please do so. Call me Theo. <laughs> Don't call me Professor Ruiz or anything like that. Now, I am not going to be talking about witches. I'm going to be talking about the witch craze, which is a very different phenomenon from witches. And I'm going to be talking about a very specific period of time, which is the early modern period in Western Europe. I have been teaching this class for 45 years to very large classes. It's one of the favorite classes for my students, although I feel myself very meretricious when I teach this class. So I uh, darken the room, I put candles on the floor, I put music, a kind of Afro-Brazilian music. And then after five minutes, the students are becoming very restless. I walk into the classroom with a cape and a hat. And I teach the first 20 minutes from behind the candles. And then I put some music, I put the talking head saying, this ain't no party, this ain't no disco, and here is the syllabus. So I do this a little bit of, it's so meretricious to do this to attract the students. So I want to do this uh, magical thing, which means sharing the screen. All right. So, which is the terror of history is really about the wish craze and so on. And let's begin as I begin all my classes. Every class I teach, unless it is a little seminar, I begin with this image. It is an image of Walter Benjamin, who was born in 1892 and died in 1940. An essayist, a philosopher, a thinker, a man of great vision. He wrote an extraordinary book on arcades in Paris. He is responsible for the idea of the flaneur. He fled the horror of the Nazis, came to the Spanish border, which was closed that day as he was trying to make his way to the United States. And in despair, he committed suicide. Ooh. I always begin my lectures with Walter Benjamin because I mean, the many things that he wrote, he wrote two very short excerpts in one of his collections called the Thesis on the Philosophy of History. And in the first one, which is a critique of historicism, he says to us, or he writes and he tells us that history is of course always written by the winners. And that the winners parade those cultural artifacts that essentially legitimize the world. But then he says that there is no monument of civilization that is not at the same time a monument of barbarism that every great work of art 
every great building and so on, had been purchased with the toil and inequities and the suffering of the many, which is why he commands us to brush history against the grain and to make history from below. So the other thing that he wrote is a very short excerpt called The Angel of History. He's seen the painting by Clay, by Paul Clay. I actually saw the painting in the Pompidou two years ago. And they, I, I hate photography and I photograph myself next to it. It's actually quite a small painting. As you could see, it's a very ghastly painting. Benjamin tells us that he has seen the painting by Clay and he wants to think of it as the angel of history. And the angel of history sits on top of a hill and he looks into the past and his back is turned into the future. And he sees in front of him all the inequities and inhumanities that humans perpetrate on other humans. The genocide, the Holocaust, the discrimination, all those kinds of things. And he wants to come and put a stop to all of this. But a wind is blowing from paradise and it's cutting his wings and it's propelling him inexorably into the future. That pile of debris growing always a skyward, Walter Benjamin tells us, is what we call progress. And what do I do this? And why do I begin? And no other close or no other lecture is so fitting for this beginning than this one. Because in Europe from the late Middle Ages, roughly from 1840s to the 1660s, a period which we teach in our classes and which we talk all the time about the Renaissance and the scientific revolution and a great moment for cultural artifacts. It's also a period in which there are horrific wars of religion, which destroy most of Central Europe. But there is also a very well organized by those same people who are essentially patrons for the arts and for the sciences, scientists themselves, scholars, and there is a well-organized hunt of witches in which around 100,000 people, mostly women of certain age, women beyond the age of reproduction, are either burned at the stake or hung from the necks. How could this be? How could we essentially forget about the on the side of history, the kind of things that happen? This, of course, is a map of Los Angeles, as you could see, El Segundo is here. It's a map of Europe, of course, because I will mention later that there is a kind of topography of witch craze. Essentially, the witch craze is a phenomenon that is not a Mediterranean phenomenon. There are some witches in Spain and there are some witches in Italy, but essentially it's a French, German, Scandinavian, and English phenomenon. Why? Because the people in the Mediterranean were more enlightened? No because they had their own targets and scapegoats. They didn't need witches to worry about. So the question that I want to, see, to say is how do we come to this? How did the witch craze happen? May I point out to you that in the Renaissance, in the period which we call the Renaissance from the 14th century all the way into the 16th century, magic, alchemy, astrology, and hermeticism which is the ideas of somebody called Hermes Trismegistus are very important. And when we look back to the Middle Ages, there is no systematic persecution of witches. There are systematic persecution of other people, but not of all women who are accused of being witchcraft. How do we come to this? Why did this happen and how did it happen? I think that we begin by defining the mental landscape. What I meant to say is that in the late Middle Ages, in the 15th century, if you think of the mental landscape as a kind of a box, you have three categories or three different kinds of things, science, religion, and magic. Science has a lot of religion and has a lot of, of magic. Religion has some pretensions of science and certainly a lot of magic and magic claims to be a science and they all intertwine together. It is a kind of confused intellectual landscape. By the 1660s in Europe and 1690s in the Americas, 
we get to a world which in which science is quite distinct from religion and in which magic has been essentially subordinated, put down to people who are ignorant and without knowledge, which was not the case during the Renaissance. What I meant to say is that one of the ways in which we can explain the witch craze is this extreme way in which the European intellectuals try to define the mental landscape in which they live, in which they try to separate science from religion, religion from magic, and so on. I already talked about the topography of the witch craze and pointing out that this is mostly a northern phenomenon, even though there are some witches who are brought to trial by the Inquisition in Italy or in Spain, they are few and far in between. But essentially, we also can explain the coming of the witch craze by the anxieties created by the struggle between secularism and religion. Please remember that at the end of the Middle Ages, at the beginning of the early modern period, the church, the Christian church, begins to redefine itself in different terms. But it's also facing a world which is becoming increasingly secular. And this conflict between secular attitudes, which are scientific in nature, and religion begin essentially to become a source of anxiety, anxiety that it is manifested and articulated to the persecutions of others. In a great book written 40 years ago, when I was not as old as I am now, by an English scholar named Keith Thomas, it's a book entitled Religion and the Decline of Magic. We can see how Keith Thomas, who is writing about England and the rise of Protestant churches in England, begins to talk about how new kinds of religiosity, specifically some aspects of Protestant religion, in the 16th century also lead to a kind of decline in magic, that there is a connection between different forms of religiosity and declines of magic. And further, I want to point out to you what we all, you all know, that of course there are two kinds of religious thought. There are two kinds, two levels of religion. There's religion at the very high level, which is essentially the way in which you try to appropriate ethical concepts at the very high level. And then there is religion at the bottom of society, a religion that is articulated through talismans and magical objects and which has a great deal of superstition in which we embrace the magical world thinking that it is a religious world. Think about our own life. How do you get up in the morning? The students here who use a particular pen for their exams because that's a lucky pen, that's magical pen that will give them an A and so on. Think about that and think about religion at the high level. Please, what we are talking about here is the relationship between high culture and low culture, high forms of religion and low forms of religion. And it is indeed the kind of circularity between these two that is also to a certain extent responsible for the witch craze. Jean Baudin, who was a, a, a lawyer and a, a kind of a thinker in 16th century France, defined witchcraft as a person who, by concert with the devil, practices evil acts or evil deeds. I am paraphrasing him. But that is witchcraft in the Western tradition. And I want to emphasize here, and I want to make very clear, that what Europeans brand as witchcraft in other places, in Africa, in Brazil, in Haiti, in Cuba, and so on, is not witchcraft. It's essentially another form of religion. That witchcraft is a particularly Abrahamic concept, and in this case, Western European concept, because it implies the existence of the devil, which is not present in all cultures. So when European missionaries arrive in, in Africa or in Brazil or in Cuba, or, they will brand certain behavior as witchcraft, but it is not. It is forms of religion that date back to Africa or to in Asia, to Indian culture and so on, 
and which have nothing to do with the European construction of, of, the, of the discourse of which grace or witchcraft. So we begin to try to set up the context for the witch craze. Long ago, Hugh Trevor Roper, an English historian who ended his life in ignominy because he said he had discovered Hitler's diaries and it was not true, argued quite convincingly that at the end of the Middle Ages, the civilization of the plain begins to enter the mountains. That there have always been two worlds, the world of the mountain people, which never is fully Christianized. Think of Levi talking about uh, God to stop at Eboli. That is to say God never got to the other place because it's too far away. It is in the mountains and the plains. And it is the conquer of the mountains by the plain that brings Christian preachers and missionaries in contact with all kinds of ideas and forms of belief that we are really not forms of witchcraft, but that we are pre-Christian kinds of rituals and beliefs associated with vegetation religions and so on. And later on, I will talk about, oh no, I should talk about this right now. The great Carlo Ginsberg, who was a professor at UCLA for many years, wrote a great book many, many years ago called Ibn Andanti, The Good Walkers. And he discovers how Inquisition people go to the Friuli and they find this group of people who argue that because they have been born within the call, between the Amiotis sack, they can go in a spirit and fight the bad witches to protect the, cro the crops from being destroyed. Of course, the missionaries are not anthropologists. They have no clue what the hell this is all about. And they brand them as witches. And over 80 years of time, they convince these poor people that they are truly witches and have them confess to that. So the Christianization of Europe, which is a very long and millenarian process, also coincides with the growing of an anti-witch discourse that from Thomas Aquinas to the late 15th century begins to develop. Strange as it may seem, Aquinas who is the representative of rationality in 13th century Christianity and in 13th century Europe, in one of his quote Libet, has a passage in which he begins to discuss the possibility that witches through the intersection of Satan can actually make men impotent. Please keep that into your head because we're gonna be talking about impotence a great deal. So when does this happen? When these missionaries go to the mountains, they find all these incredible forms of behavior. They return to the cities, they return to Rome and tell the Pope something is really going wrong out there. Innocent VIII in 1484 passes a bull called Summa Desiderantes Affectivus in which he sends two Dominican missionaries, Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Sprenger to go to the mountains. They go, they see, they return to Rome and write a book that is one of the most influential texts in the history of the witch grace and in the psychological history of Europe. It's called the Malius Maleficarum, published in 1486, printed in 1486. It's the Hammer of Witches. It is a, a book that it is a riot to read. It's divided into three parts. The first is how do we recognize a witch? Second, how do you deal with them judicially? And third, how can you avoid being the victim of a curse from a witch? The first part is pure misogyny. And it is women who are essentially branded with the possibility of witchcraft because of course they are weak and irrational and very easily prey to the temptations of the devil. But it goes beyond that. After all, we have here all adults in this room in this Zoom session. So the stories are amazing. And one of the things driving this story is the fear of men becoming impotent. One of the things that the witches can do is that they can steal your organs, they can steal your penis. And there is a famous story in there in which a, in, a, in a village, the witches have stolen the penis of every male. And the priest is going around and he sees a nest and he sees all the penises of the village and he chooses one which was not his 
but one which was more generous than his. And he's discovered and people make fun of him. You could see the kind of things that are happening in the mind of Dominican priests at this time. But of course, it's not, this book is not responsible for the beginning of the witch craze. There are other things at work. I'm going to go very quickly here. And one of the things, of course, is that the economy of Europe at the end of the Middle Ages is being dramatically transformed. And so is the social structure of Europe. The village community has been, and, and witchcraft is a rural phenomenon. That is to say, it happens sometimes in cities. There are cases in which people in cities are brought in charges of witchcraft, but it's mostly rural phenomena. It's mostly villages. The villages, villages which have been for centuries based upon communal activities, that is to say, working the land together, collecting the harvest together, and so on, are now being fragmented by the rise of rich farmers, by intrusion of capital from the cities, by essentially the creation of rural poverty, which had not existed in Europe until then. People being thrown out of the lands, enclosures going up. We will talk about this later on in relation to England. If you read Thomas More Utopia, the half of the book is about the miserable conditions in England where the poor is in the roads and it's being whipped and it's being put in poor houses and it's being thrown out of the farms. Remember, it's the outsider that we always target as scapegoats. It's the immigrant, it's the person who is different from us, it's the person who is in different circumstances from us. So this economic and social context, which is going to lead to a great peasant uprising in Germany in 1521, is an important context for the anxieties that are spread throughout Europe. Politically, Max Weber, in a lapidary phrase, say it very clearly, the rise of the state in the late 15th century consists in the legalized monopoly of violence. What I meant to say is that the world in which we lived until the 13th, 14th century is giving way to centralized monarchies who can now conscript you, who can tax you, in which essentially bring their power to bear upon you, whatever you are. And on top of that, you have situations in which you have cultural changes, the beginning of the Renaissance, the beginning of science, the throwing of fear into the hearts of Europeans. Which is why, and of course, the, the great, I will talk about this in a few minutes. So a great French scholar called Jean de Lumont wrote a great book called Père en Occident, La Père en Occident, Fear in the West, in which he argues pretty convincingly that the witch craze is a way in which the people in power essentially channel all the discontent that exists because of economic, social, and political and cultural changes. They all essentially channel all these energies into someone who become responsible. Things are not working. The pandemic is racing through the United States. The economy is shot. So should we blame for this? Let's choose a target that we can demonize and then they will forget that many of these issues are the responsibilities of the people who rule. And now you could see how this work. Misogyny, and I want to talk about that, but I, I, I am going to reserve that for the next uh, page in which I'm gonna show you. The second, the, the final thing, which in this screen is the words of religion. Christianity has already been divided into two camps, the Orthodox Church in the East, this dating from the 11th century, and the Catholic Church in the West. The, the church in the East has essentially fallen into the hands of the Ottoman Turks. So they don't matter anymore and they never matter anyway for the people in the West. In the West, there is a monolithic church. And in 1521, although there is a series of heresies that essentially challenge the authority of the church, including in the 15th century with the Hussite rebellion. In 1521, Luther takes his revolutionary step of not only breaking with the church in Rome, but also of essentially challenging most of the central dogmas of the church, including transubstantiation. By 1525, Europe is at war. Protestant rulers, Protestant princes on the side of Luther, 
Catholics led mostly by Spain engaged in ferocious wars in the Low Countries, in the Central Europe and so on. These wars will last until 1648, until the Treaty of Westphalia. It will devastate Europe, but it will also be one of the agents for the spread of the witch craze. It is not a coincidence that in Catholic villages, the witches are usually Protestant, and that in Protestant villages, the witches are usually Catholic. And you could see how this is still happens to this very day. So I wanted to point out to you, go back to what Max Weber said, that the rise of the state in Europe in the late 15th century, not everywhere, not in Italy, not in Germany, but certainly in France and in England and in Spain and so on, leads to these causes of exclusion and inclusion. Who is going to be part of this project? They are the people who are part of this project. They are Christians, they are English, they are French, they are Castilians, they are Aragonese, and they are people who do not belong. And the people who do not belong, and there, there is a certain correlation between witches and Jews, the people who do not belong are going to be either persecuted, exterminated, or expelled. So all these discourses of difference are essentially emphasized and augmented by the shock of the new. And what is the new? The discovery of a new world, the discovery of all kinds of new people that exist who did not know Christianity and who shake the foundations of Western culture because all those great texts from antiquity are proven to be wrong. Now, what Carlo Ginsberg says in his book, The Benandanti, is that we never take into consideration the survival of pre-Christian beliefs which are very strong and anybody who has ever lived in Europe. When I was a child on the 23rd of June, we used to run around a fire, a bonfire and jump over the bonfire and, and dance around the bonfire. What in the world was that? Well, that is cause the fire festivals of Europe that predate Christianity by millennia. But what makes the witch craze so European is the question of the devil is a question of Satan. And there you have a great uh, kind of carving by Albrecht Dürer, which is the quintessential representation of the devil. The devil has a long history in Christianity or in Judaism or in Islam, in the Abrahamic religion, mostly because all these Abrahamic religions are really the children of Zoroastrian beliefs with a kind of a strong dualism between good and evil, light and darkness and so on. So the devil is an angel, is the, the morning light, is Lucifer who rebels against God and assaults the throne of God, loses in the battle, thrown into hell, sent down completely. But the devil is not only the adversary, but the devil is also an agent of God. And you could see it. God is sitting at a Starbucks with Satan. She's having a latte and she tells Satan, look at my children, they love me, look at Job, like he loves me like crazy. And Satan said, yeah, because you treat him nicely, but give it to me for a little while and I will show you how he comes to hate you. So the, this is a conundrum of dealing with the question of the devil. It is the question that on the one hand, he is the adversary, he is the enemy. On the other hand, he only operates with the permission of God. He doesn't have power separate from God. He acts, he tempts us, he does all kinds of things. He tempts people into committing maleficium, evil deeds, but he does so with God's permission. And it's a, it's a difficult theological point to discuss. But for the witches, or at least for the representation of the witches by the people who write about them who are the enemy, Satan is God. It's an alternate God that essentially stands contrary to the divinity of the Catholic Trinity, 
or the God in Israel or Allah in Islam. Now, I see that I have a, a, a kind of uh, misspell here. I want to revisit the question of gender because there are many feminist scholars who always think of witchcraft and the witch craze essentially as a kind of gender issue. The fact of the matter is that the position of women in Western society has always been fraught with problems. From the classical works in Athens, from the, the great classics to the Bible, what we have here is a kind of relentless attack on women, who in the Greek world are considered to be beneath reason and therefore not worthy of being loved, to passages in the Old and New Testament in which women are depicted as weak or tempters or temptresses and the one, of course, who are responsible for the fall of man. In this late Middle Ages and in the early 16th century, there are more women than males. Not only because women are stronger than males and live longer, but because of wars and sickness and so on have affected the male population. So there is a lot of women who are independent of men and who lived on the edges of town, engaging in herbal medicine, aging in curing healing arts and so on. By the way, the, the incipient or the genesis of the medical profession does not look with these healers and deliverers of babies and, you know, sort of, these are enemies. And in fact, women to help in the bringing up of babies into the world are one of the favorite targets of the people who are looking for witches. So we have to look at witch craze as a form of misogyny, as a, as a relentless attack on women. There is a brief moment of time in the 12th century through courtly love in which women are put essentially in, in, moment, in a point of strong position. But by the 14th century, it's a relentless attack on women and it will continue until two days ago. So I said to you that uh, in the Middle Ages, there is no systematic attack against witches. It just doesn't happen. By the early modern period, this become a well-organized hunting of witches. And in fact, people don't call it a witch race, people call it a witch hunt. And they are torture, which is a common practice in the inquisitorial questioning, both by Protestants and Catholics alike, because it's a belief that if you torture someone, you can obtain the truth. Although what you confess on the torture is not acceptable, you will have to confess again without torture. Throughout Northern Europe, Germany, in Trier, there is a village in which no woman is left alive. In other villages, very few women survive. See, are massacres of witches. They are brought to the stake and burnt at the stake. And in order to kill them, you have a series of experts. And we're going to see some of them who identify who a witch is. And a great deal of this comes from the Malus Maleficarum that describe precisely what are the, should we say, the behavior, the typical behavior of witches, how to identify them and how to bring them to trial. There is also something peculiar, which is, of course, that the confessions of witches have an eerie similarity, whether it is in Catholic world or in the Protestant world, whether it is in England, Germany, or France, or Scandinavia. That you have essentially the same kind of things being confessed to. Never flying with a broom. That's an invention of Macy's in the 19th century but of flying to nocturnal gatherings in the back of devils, of doing mischief, of engaging in orgies, all kinds of things like that. And they all confess to the same. Why? Because the questions are all the same. Because one of the things that the Malius does is develop a system of questioning in which if I question you enough, I will get essentially to you to repeat what I am asking you to say. And what is most troubling about this is that all the learned men in Europe, with some exceptions, are essentially engaged in serious discussions 
on the reality of witchcraft. So that in Catholic Europe, or even in Protestant Europe, if you do not believe that they are witches that consort with Satan and that are in a major conspiracy to overthrow the Christian world and society, then you are a heretic. And for example, Aquinas had began to develop a discourse on witches. It prospers throughout the 14th century and it comes to full bloom in the 15th and 16th century. Martin Luther writes on witches. James I, the man who sponsored the writing of the King's, the King James Bible, is somebody who writes a treatise on how the witches can, or how demons can make witches pregnant by stealing the penis and the semen from dead people and then impregnating people. So this is what is in the mind. You could see how crazy this truly is. This is one of the great paintings by Goya, the Inquisition Tribunal. And this is a, one of these, you know, this is how, this is how you popularize the killing and burning of witches. You do it through prints that are circulated through our society, for even for people who cannot read and who have access to this manner. And you could see the witches and you could see essentially a serpent, the devil fleeing or the fellow, the, the devil coming to pick the witch who is being burned and take her into hell where she belongs. So I know that this is essentially what you wanted to hear. This is precisely what you wanted to know, how to become a witch so we can influence the election on Tuesday. Francesco Maria Wasso wrote a book in 1608 called the Compendium Maleficarum. And it's a book in which she explains how you become a witch. And I'm going to go very quickly because we don't have too much more time and I wanted a time for questions and answers. The first thing is that you write a pact. The witches and the devil are really very legalistic, which is why we always identify lawyers with Satan. That is to say, you make a legal contract with the devil usually written in blood, place at the intersection of several roads, which is why in Europe, where many roads can converge, you have always a cross to prevent the devils from congregating there. And you promise to serve the devil for 24 years, for life and so on, in return for which the devil will give you what you want. Passing organic chemistry, which you only the devil can help you pass, uh, wealth, uh, sex, and the sweetest of all things, revenge. And these are the terms of the pact and they are placed on crossroads. And I have many examples. Sometimes you have an, a, a consecrated host that is placed in together with the pact and so on. And then the devil gives you a mark. It imprints you. It essentially imprints you with his mark. It's a mark of a little toad a bat, and it's usually found in your armpits or in your genitalia. And there is, a, and, and you could see what the implications of being branded are here. You become a, an, essentially a slave of the devil. And there is a whole group of people called the prickers who go around with long needles and they put it through the, through the mark. And if it doesn't bleed, I said, you're gone. And you could see these people are not very reputable. Then you abjure, you uh, cast away rosaries, scapularies, etc. Then you pay homage to the devil. And uh, those of you who are into being prude, you could close your ears because document after document always describe this in very clear terms. You pay homage to the devil by kissing his behind while he emits a filthy and foul air. It still goes on in our world. You swear to gain followers, you engage in a sacrilegious baptism, you need good parents, you get new names because when you name someone, you have power over that person. You give a token to the devil, a piece of your clothing, a piece of your hair, we still do that to our beloved. You enter into the magic circle and then you are inscribed in the devil's book. And then you engage in sacrifices. Animals are sacrificed, but mostly children. This is the accusation that is hurled against the witches. 
and I am running quickly. And here the assembly of witches. And then, of course, you have the feast that these supposedly these witches engage in. Is the Sabbath not having to do anything with the Jewish Sabbath? This have to do with Sabbatius, a Pharyngian deity. They are great and small ones. The biggest of them all is not Halloween. Halloween is a, is a, is a feast day invite, invented by Amazon and, and, and Macy's. The great day is Palpuchis Nach, the 30th of April, because it is the day before May 1st, which is a day of great importance in rural Europe. There are other days, the eve of St. John the Baptist, the 23rd of June, and the witches are accused by the enemies. And remember, we only have the, the version of the enemies as child murderers, midwives are charged with stealing babies and then bringing them to the gathering of witches and killing them there. And they are also essentially charged with cannibalism, sexual orgies, ritual dancing, animals, use of phallic symbols, use of phalluses in these gatherings. You see that these are precisely the same accusations which were raised against Christians when at the very beginning of Christianity that were raised against Jews later on when Christians were in power that were raised against Muslims in Christian Europe that were raised against natives of the new world and it is the kind of ways in which you can create a division between those who are human and those who are not. I am human because I don't eat people. And you are unhuman and beastly because you eat some and you engage in all these practices. And some more engraving of witches. They are absolutely here are the witches flying to the Black Sabbath. But of course, they have, they have, she's flying in the shoulders or in the backs of a demon that is carrying her there. We are getting to the, to the very end here. And I, I want to do something about the real social history of witchcraft. There is a great book written by somebody named Alan Machfelen about witchcraft in Essex in England. And we have the records from the Assis. And we can do, we know certain things about the social compositions of the people who are accused of witchcraft and the people who accuse them. We know that almost 90% of all the people who are brought to trial and condemned and burned at the stake are women over the age of 50. Some of them very old. We know that these women live by themselves on the edge of towns without male supervision. We know that they are not the very poor, but they are not, they are really in economic straits. <clears throat> they are caught in between the very poor and the bottom who doesn't call the attention of the authorities and the people on top of them. We know that as people are thrown into the roads because of enclosures, many of these people who are new to the village become the targets for accusations of witchcraft. We know that the accusers are half male and half female, whereas the accused are mostly female and all female. We know that most of the accusations come from people who are related to you by wedding. What we always knew that your mother-in-law was a witch. And I had a mother-in-law in my first marriage who actually came into my house through the window flying on a, on a, on a broom. We know that these people who are accused of witchcraft tend to engage in ancestral practices they are blasphemous, and most of all, they're cursed. And I can tell you what it is, what happens. Now, if you are over 50, you are a female, you are bent. And since you are a member of the lower classes, you dress in dark colors, and you have warts, and you have lost all your teeth. It's the kind of hatred of the old in a world before modernity where we can prolong our lives for so long and a world like ours in which adolescence doesn't end until 72 or something like that. So you come to the door and you said, a piece of bread for the love of God, which is the kind of formulaic way in which you beg. <clears throat> and the guy said, get out of here, you all had 
she turns around and said, I curse you. That man in the evening cannot perform. Obviously, in a world without Viagra, it must be the witch's fault. So go get her and kill her. So look like a witch, die like a witch. Now, the question, of course, is where they are witches? Did all this happen? My point of view? No. Were there people who believe that they were witches? Yes, there are such people today. Were there people who believe themselves to be witches? Yes, I have them in my classes too. But were there people who actually flew in the back of demons to nocturnal gatherings and who engaged in cannibalism and so on? No. It is part of the kind of mythification of others that still goes on to this very day. Is the manner in which we can describe someone by pejorative terms and essentially diminish their humanity so that we can excoriate them and even kill them. So no, they were not real witches as described by these people in Europe. This is a great painting by Goya. And these are more engravings of witches being tortured and executed. And you could see that they are executed in large numbers this is in England where they were not burned. In England, they were, they hang from the necks. And this is a great painting by Goya, because in the end, this is what is the terror of history. It's time eating us, devouring us. We are the children of time. We are the victims of time. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it and I am ready to answer any questions you may have and I'm going to, I should not leave this ghastly image there. I should go back to myself and here we are. Well, thank you very much, uh, 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 Teo. It's, it's a little difficult to give you a rigorous round of applause with Zoom, but we can do the best we can perhaps. Uh, no, the applause is for you guys, for you guys. Uh, there. Uh, so I, I was looking yeah, at I think, and did not fall asleep. I think um, why don't we uh, just ask people to ask questions? Mm -hmm. I think it'll stay orderly. Uh, I think we can do that without having to call on people and so on. Uh, Bob, I see Bob Vermont. I see you have your uh, my uh, hand up. Yeah, hand up. Oh. Yes. So you want to okay. start? Okay. There is a way to do that. I participate in uh, these things uh, weekly with a bunch of people and we've learned how to raise our hands. Some have learned how to raise their hands. Anyhow, my question is it kind of two questions. One, how much of witchcraft evolved from paganism, the pagan gods and goddesses? And my second question is what is, um, uh, where, would you, what, where would you categorize superstition in terms of witchcraft people do things or don't do things, uh, carry, you know, the silly thing is a rabbit foot around, but uh, I've read about pilots in World War II wouldn't do things in a certain way and only did it in another way because that's how they believed they would stay alive. Some succeeded and some didn't. So to your, to your question, the first one is that witchcraft, they are witches, they are witches in the Old Testament, the witch of Endor. Saul goes to the, to the witch of Endor's cave. He dances in front of the witch of Endor. So they are witches in, in the Abrahamic religion. They are people who have magical power. There is always a belief in magic. The, the I would not call it them pagan, the non-Christian religions in the classical world, the religions of the Greeks and the Romans, or even of the Germans and so on, did not accept the idea of witchcraft as defined by Europeans, because the European definition of witchcraft implies the existence of the devil. There is no devil in many of these religions in, 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 in the same manner in which there is no God in some religions. Mm -hmm. You know, ancestral belief or, or the Buddha was not a God, didn't want to be a God. The only thing he wanted was to get out of the will of life. So there are connections in which there is people who practice magic. And the, this, the description which you call superstition is of course the, the, the enduring presence of magic in our world. 
we all engage in certain magical gestures, whether it is touching a masusa when you leave the house, it's religious, but it's also magical, whether you carry the rosary around your neck, whether you, whether you do all kinds of things which you see as protective. In the Spanish Civil War, the requetés from Navarre, ultra-Catholic supporters of Franco, always believed that if you wore an escapulary, you will never die in mortal sin. So they went out, took communion, and then went out and sinned as much as they could. And then the next day, they got a bullet through their heart. So, you know, it's, it's like religion is the next stage of magic. In the ancient, in the pre-civilization world, magic and magic is still works to this very day in many societies. Magic was a way in which you try to control the universe. And when you realize that you cannot control the universe, then you create God or you believe in a God to whom you delegate all the things. Whatever happened is God's doing. So, so questions. Daniel, guide me because I don't see people here and there is a whole where, other, three where other. Would you, where would you put superstition though? Superstition, I will put it as a part and parcel of human experiences because we are filled with superstition to this very day. The there are very few people who are not superstitious in the world in which we live to this very day. And it might not be the gross superstition of believing in witches or the gross superstition of believing in anything like that, but it is the, the little superstition of believing, for example, that there are certain churches that are really good when you go on a date. They are really the successful ones, or there are certain ways in which you get out of bed on the right foot or, 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 or not to cross over the line. You know, the kind of things that we learn from childhood to avoid because, well, who knows? This is a kind of Kantian element here to the, the, the bet, you know, bet that God assists. So anything else? Anyone else? Um... Uh, I'll ask you something. Um, uh, I, I just can't help asking this because uh, I was just discussing uh, Shakespeare's play Macbeth uh, in my uh, seminar a couple of days ago with students. Um, uh, the three sisters, uh, the weir weird sisters in, in, uh, in Macbeth, um, they certainly do... Uh, harass people and they describe a little bit of that. Do you, are, they, are they in this tradition that you're talking about or in this movement or is Shakespeare, do you think there's something different? Uh, Shakespeare, is engaged in a, Shakespeare is engaged in a great battle against magic and witchcraft belief. And yes, the three witches in Macbeth are like not only typical of Western European witchcraft, but they also resemble a little bit the, the norms, which are the three women who sit at the bottom of the sacred tree in Nordic religion and who very much like the fates weave the life of men and women. So, you know, Shakespeare is a, is a very interesting person to examine because for example, the Tempest is, is a denial of magic and astrology which is a part and parcel of a great debate in Europe over the validity of magic and what was called before superstition. In Romeo and Juliet, you know, there's also engaged in this an alchemist, the priest is an alchemist and so on. So there is all kinds of clues in Shakespeare about the mental world of the people who lived in his time. But I think about John Donne's The Valediction for Bidding Morning which is a beautiful poem, I think one of the most beautiful poems in English, and which is filled with astrological signs and symbols. Tico Brache, who is the, the person who looks at the sky better than anybody else, is a believer in hermeticism, in the sun, God as sun, at the sun and things like that. So it's, this is a very complex world, in, but this is the, the beliefs of the people at the top as opposed to the belief of the people at the bottom. But of course, the people at the top are using these beliefs and there is this circulation between high and low and it leads to the death of poor old women in the villages. Yes, Stephen raised his hand very forcefully. Yes, I cannot hear you. Stephen. You have to, you have to unmute yourself. 
Yeah, there I go. And uh, by the way, I want to just let you know I brought my familiar. Oh, oh that's hilarious. right. I didn't talk about familiars. Yeah, you have your familiar. Attentive. Yeah, you have your, your black cat. Uh, um, I, I wonder if, if one could uh, kind of argue that one of the facilitating factors in the witch craze uh, during the 16th and 17th century uh, is, is the advent of printing. Uh, it, it, it would seem to me that the witch craze is largely a grassroots movement that kind of props up, spreads uh, from locality to locality. And, and you've mentioned yourself, uh, all the, um, probably just mentioning the most prominent uh, of the publications that appeared um, the Hammer of the Witches and uh, King James, and you showed Matthew Hopkins, uh, I think it's, what is it called? The uh, Discovery of Witches, maybe that's James's text. In any event, there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a whole lot of, there's a whole literature that appears and, and circulates about witches being out there and how to find them. Um, if it didn't happen pre-print, maybe that's one of the reasons it happens later on. It needs that as a catalyst. Uh, th th that is possible. You know, there is a witch discourse that is evolving from the 13th century onward when there is no printing. But what it is is that there is no, that doesn't mean that Europe is not a persecutory society. It is, you know, the, the great persecution of heretics or the great persecution of an expulsion of Jews or the very restrictive norms that appeared in the Four Lateran Council in 1215. But I think printing plays a, printing plays a significant role in the mental world of Europe in this period. One important thing that I did not mention, but I wanted, which is a chalk of the new, is a discovery of a new world. And this discovery of a new world has an impact beyond the learned people because it is circulated. And one of the things that we must understand is that very few people know how to read or write, but all these things are read aloud. And so you come to a village with a book and so on and read it aloud. In Carlo Ginsberg, uh, The Cheese and the Worm, which is a great book, like all his books are great books. Uh, he talks about a, a miller called Menocchio, whose great crime was that he read and he had a book inconceivable that a miller would have owned a book 200 years before. So, you know, the access to certain learning is also part of the, the manner in which you can circulate these ideas. Oliver, uh, did you want to, uh, Oliver? Uh, yes, I, I'd love to ask a question about James the Sixth, because he is James the Sixth first, and then James the First. I, um, I, I spoken like a good Scotchman here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, who imports uh, the witchcraft um, hunting from his wife's country, Denmark, to Scotland with North Berwick. You showed a lovely little picture of the North Berwick witches being, um, being, being, being tried and then murdered. Um, and then he unites this with uh, not only a book, Demonology, about witchcraft, but also a book about, um, about uh, centralised monarchy. He, he's the figure who seems to unite all this, and he's the, also the man who promotes colonization of Ireland and then the, the Americas. He seems to be perhaps the villain, or at least uh, the prime mover of this. Well, to begin with, it's a wonderful comment. I, I mean, it's, it's not a question, so I cannot answer, but let me comment on your comment, which is, yes, you're right, uh, Gregory, uh, Gregory. I'm looking at Gregory Howell, who is a friend. Uh, James the first, or James the sixth, uh, or Scotland, is a is a critical figure here. But the Scandinavian countries was a hotbed for witchcraft. So Scandinavia goes pretty hard uh, to against these uh, people who are accused of witchcraft. The colonization of Ireland by during the reign of James the first, James the sixth, is a pretty horrid thing. During the, the English Civil War, which comes afterwards, Irishmen caught in the open road in England were essentially liable to be killed with no judgment or trial or anything like that. 
But Ireland was considered by the elite Englishmen as being very prone to superstition. Here comes the word again, believing in ghosts and all kinds of things. So, but that's a very wonderful comment. And, and yes, there's a lot for which James should be blamed. Even though he commissioned the writing of the King James Bible, which is utterly incorrect, but which is also very beautiful. And, and of course, he was a Roman Catholic. Yes, yes. Anxious to avoid the civil wars that were going on over religion in Europe, but by, by um, temporizing this. And I think a lot of what Shakespeare is writing about is to make nice to, 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 the, to the king. So do you think perhaps this is a, a top down, um, a, a, you know, a top-down crisis, or is it, as, as um, somebody else, as Stephen suggested, discourse, a bottom-up yeah, thing? That's a very good question. The discourse of, of witchcraft is a top-down discourse, but it's circular. It comes back to the top. So, first of all, this is a, this is a huge apparatus, very well organized, with inquisitors, with, with Protestant questioners, with trials, with assizes. So this is this is the state showing its fans on the people below. But but the people below, as it is always the case, ingest this kind of discourse and believe it. They are not innocent in the denunciations of the fellow village men or village women. They are not innocent. I mean, so they, they have internalize these discourses that were first formulated at the top. As I said to you, that it begins with Thomas Aquinas, who is the greatest philosopher of the 13th century, or probably the greatest medieval Christian philosopher. And he already begins to be concerned and worried with all these things, with the challenges that believe in the devil presents for the established church. Okay, uh, Greg Smith. Uh... Greg, you have to uh, unmute yourself. Uh, were, were Jews were Jews particular targets of the of the witch craze, or were they oppressors uh, in the witch craze, or were they sufficiently separate from society to not really be a part of it? The Jews are not uh, particularly victims of the witch craze. However, I think I indicated some of this. The representation of the devil coincides with the representation of the Jews. Now, remember this. We're talking about the 16th century. In the 16th century, there are no Jews in England. There are no Jews in France. There are no Jews in Spain. There are Jews in Italy where the Pope essentially confines them to a ghetto or in Venice and so on, but, but where there is no persecution of Jews. Because essentially, witchcraft is a form of heresy. And you can only be a heretic in your own religion. That is to say, a Muslim cannot be a heretic in Christianity. A Christian cannot be a heretic in Islam, or Jews cannot be heretics in Christianity. From time to time, they get taken, and the Jews okay. are always sort of represented as magicians or friends of the evil one, but there is no organized attacks against the Jews as for example, there would be in 1348 during the Black Death or, or in 1391 in Spain or something like that. But you know, Jews were expelled from England in 1296, from Northern France in 1303, from Southern France in 1380, from Spain in 1492. So, you know, the Jews have been moving to North Africa, to Portugal, to Rome, to Amsterdam, and to the Ottoman Empire. I want to get uh, Don Marshall in a minute. Uh, uh, I can't see everybody at once, so if you're trying there are, to... There are four screens on the other side. Which yeah, but uh, let me but... just ask before going to Don, um, are there any students who would like to ask a question? Yes, yes, by my student there. Unmute yourself, Hi. Elaine, Elaine the Wonderful. Hello. Hello, um, Elaine. So I had a Where question. Do Where do you go? Um, I'm here. Yeah. I'm still here. Um, I had a question regarding uh, 
uh, how men would be targeted as witches. So I know that for women, it had to do with age or um, different practices or just paranoia. But what would a man have to do to be accused of witchcraft? Uh, men are accused of witchcraft. And in Lithuania, half of the people brought to trial are male, different from Western Europe. So it's very strange. They are accused of consorting with the devil or engaging in malpractices to, you know, doing evil deeds. They are usually always together with another woman or with other women. So they, they come into it. The most famous case of a male brought on charges of witchcraft occurs in the 17th century in the city of Loudon. And it's the case of Urban Grandier in the 1640s or something like that. There is a wonderful book by Aldous Huxley called The Devil. And there is a wonderful movie made by Ken Russell called The Devils with Vanessa Redgrave and Oliver Reed, which is a great thing. This man was a, a priest, a, a member of the church, actually quite high ranking. He was accused of consorting and create, uh, creating a kind of curses and enchantment on a nursery or a nun's convent nearby. But his greatest crime was that Richelieu was his enemy. And I, I want to point out that when somebody is targeted at the high level, accusations of witchcraft are a dime a dozen, very much like the, the, you know, the famous accusations throughout the Middle Ages, sodomy, heresy. And witchcraft is also associated with sodomy. And therefore, when you accuse somebody who is high up, it's, it's a political, it's a political thing. Think about Salem, which is really about the conflict between Salem village and Salem town, between farmers and merchants. So there, there's always there's always a political. Don't we have wish hunts today? Um, hey, Tegra. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hello. Oh, okay. So my question oh. is, um, in terms of like the Inquisition and the Spanish Inquisition, um, I know that the like objectives of it kind of changed once the Protestant Reformation um, happened. So were there any? How? What was the effect on the witch craze when turned when the Inquisition kind of switched its, um, like I guess, its like headlights to to Protestants and away yeah. so. Yeah, the Inquisition, which comes to Spain very late and which is a, a very different fish from the Inquisitions in Southern France or in Italy and something like that, is a royal Inquisition, uh, is targeting conversos between 1484 when it comes officially to be in, in, in action until 1525. And 1525, they turn their, their side on Protestants, as you say, blasphemers, sodomites, and things like that. Few people are accused of witchcraft in Inquisition. However, in the 17th century, in the Basque area, there is this huge witchcraft case. Children play a very special role in witchcraft as accusers, but also as a kind of interlocutors for witches. So the great inquisitor, who named Salafar, went up to the Basque country, to Navarre, and interviewed all these people. And he said, what is this? This is nonsense. Dismiss this case. And there were hundreds of people who have been accused. And he dismissed the entire case and said, this is absolute sheer nonsense. I will not waste my time on this. And he left and the whole case collapsed. So the Inquisition was not too keen, although there are some cases. And there's a very famous case of a nun called Magdalena de la Cruz, who is brought to the Inquisition in Cordoba. And she's just confined to a monastery for 20 years. And she was a nun, so not much. Um, Don, do you want to ask your question? I wondered if there are comments or attitudes expressed by scientists in this era. I'm thinking of Kepler or um, Bacon, Descartes, Gassendi, Gilbert Harvey, Bernoulli, Gassendi. If there are scientists have any distinctive attitude about witches? The majority of them, I cannot go on the entire list and point them out, but Kepler, for example, was fascinated by a hermetic tradition, by a magical 
astrological tradition, which is why his uh, laws of planetary, planetary motion was so difficult for him to bring up because how in the hell is God failing here to make a perfect circle for the movements of planets? And it's only he gave in to the science, which show him that Newton was a believer in witches. Every night before he went to bed, he looked underneath the bed to see if there was a witch there hiding. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding, but uh, he, you know, uh, Descartes was not a, a witch believer, but with some exception, the majority of them accept the existence of the fact that you can enter into contract with God. One and two, that that there is a, an evil spirit which is an enemy of God. And so, so, strangely enough, by 1660, science wins. And what the people who have believed that this is after 1660 is heretical to believe in witches. And it's the triumph of reason. And since I am a, a lover of the, of the enlightenment, it's the kind of victory of secularism and of the enlightened views in Europe in the 17th century. And of course, flourishing in the 18th century when the ideas of the scientific revolution will be democratized and popularized by philosophers. But don't we, don't we think that scientists have it all wrong? That we know better than scientists? 21st century, 2020, the United States. Ah, science, science doesn't know. Um, what can I tell you? Any other- We need a good wish here. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, Amanda, you've been raising your hand for a really long time. Do you still have a question? Where is Amanda? Hi. Hi, Amanda. Okay, so I have a question. When you were saying how um, a lot of uh, witch hunts took place in rural areas, or at least that's what contemporary memory um, dictates, why do you think that is, whether it's, it was that way or the perception that it was mostly in rural areas? Well, witchcraft is a rural phenomenon because a great deal of the accusations of witchcraft that people who, is, who sour your milk, sort of destroy your wooden lash, kill your cow, poor people who are begging in the village and so on. So there is a kind of social and economic transformation that is taking place within the village community it's also because the division of religion, Catholics and Protestants, especially on this liminal villages between Catholic world and the Protestant world. But also because it's so much easier to have somebody who is uneducated, who is poor, who is powerless to confess to things to which you may even be convinced that exist than getting somebody at the University of Sorbonne to confess to these things. Meaning by this is that I'm not saying anything that is new or different. The people at the bottom, this is going back to Walter Benjamin. The people at the bottom always get it on the neck. Mm. It's the abuses of power of those who ruled. It's very difficult for me to talk to you because I see your photograph smiling there and I don't see you. Yeah, I'm here. And you're saying too about how um, there are plenty of contemporary um, examples of witch hunts. So do you, are there any that you can think of that are non-political though, I think? Probably. No, no, they, I think that not, not everything is, well, yeah, everything is political, but you know, not everything is overtly political. There is envies. Anybody who has ever lived in a village, I live in a village for a year. Any of you in your village, the village are sort of nest of bitterness and competition. And you know, you, you go to a house and I say, those people in that other house are terrible. And then you go to the other people in the other house. And so a great deal of um, revenge, 
violence is articulated through accusations of witchcraft. Mm. So it's, it's not necessarily political in the large sense of the word. It's, it's a kind of local conditions. Mark Bloch, who was the greatest medieval historian who had ever lived, said once that the history of the Middle Ages is the history of localities. Well, in many respects, the history of witchcraft has a general history, and then it has a local history. Switzerland was a place where, boy, did they kill witches right and left. Wow. Um, again, I can't see everybody. So anyone who has a question, just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. We have like three or four or six screens there. We actually have a question in the chat um, okay. from Nanita Domingo. Uh, she asked, what is the significance of May Day Eve? May Day is, the, is a day associated with the coming of the spring. And in rural Europe, before Christianity, May Day is a day of great importance. The church, which was always very keen in associating its own festivities with those of the rural cycle, like Marty Mass, Michael Mass, St. John and so on, May, May the, the, the month of the Virgin. So in May Day, the 1st of May, you bring a bowl of mistletoe and put it on top of the lintel of your hut because a mistletoe is an anti-witch instrument. You keep witches away by bringing the mistletoe. Since a great gathering of witches occurred on the eve of a big holiday, no one is better than May one day. May day is a day that associated with fertility. Maidens dance around the maypole, which is a phallic symbol to bring fertility to the maidens in the village. What day is Labor Day in all throughout Europe except here? May 1st. May Day. That's when every labor movement marches in everywhere in the world except in the United States. Why not in the United States? Because on May Day in the 19th century, the workers who always took the day off went out and demonstrated against their working conditions. And they were massacred by the Pinkerton Guards. And so the rest of the world chose May Day to be the day in which you celebrate labor, the day in which laborers have been killed and massacred. Here we are on the first Monday of September. This is the manner in which we erase the past and traditions and so on. But May Day is still very important in Europe. May Day is very important. And it is said that thousands of witches travel to the mountains of the Hura Mountains to celebrate Valpurgisnach. By the way, there is a wonderful uh, Fellini movie called Amacort. And you see the manner in which the witches are burned on the 30th of April in that movie. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question. Uh, this is, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, Marina. Hi. Hi. What about uh, hypnosis? Hypnosis? What about? Well, arguably, when people can hypnotize, they are witches. Oh, I didn't know about that. Uh, I, 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 not in the, not in the early modern period in Europe, because I don't think people knew about hypnotism. What there is, a, a, for example, we know that some of the people who were witches uh, sort of rub belladonna on the body, which they, they, they use some things which were hallucinants. And so, you know, I, I think you also have to realize that the people in the Middle Ages lived in a magical world always. They are always hungry. The poor is always hungry. They are always uh, in trouble. So, but I don't know anything about hypnosis. 
Uh, v. Johnson, were you asking a question? Uh, yes, thank you. I have a question. I grew up in New Mexico, and there's a book called The Witches of Abiquiu about how the Spanish colonizers thought that many Native Americans were witches because of they, their religious practices were different and that they didn't speak Spanish could be enough for, uh, for a Native American at that time, different tribes, to be killed as a witch. Can you comment on that? Absolutely. It confirms what I was saying before in the difference between Western definitions of witchcraft and, which, and what is called witchcraft elsewhere. Of course, these natives were not witches or anything like that. They had their own religious practices. But it's so easy when you meet the other, somebody who is different from you and whom you want to conquer, who you want to take the lands, who you want to put to work, to brand them as witches. Look, I... I, I grew up in Cuba. I, I am a non-believer, so. But in Cuba, I used to frequent the gatherings of Santeria, which is the same as Candomblé in Brazil. And I have been to Brazil to Candomblé ceremonies. And I have, been, I have never been to, to Haiti, but it's what it's, in Haiti is called voodoo. But I have been in Cuba and in Brazil to these ceremonies, which is African deities where there is no devil, African deities who have been Christianized as a way of allowing the people to practice that religion without being necessarily targets to Christianity. And I must confess that is uh, you know, it's pretty impressive. Pretty impressive because people dance and the music is incredibly intoxicating and you dance and then you become a god. And you go out and you dress like the god and then you dance among humans. Uh, Gregory knows this person because he actually studied with him. I think the greatest medievalist alive in the world today is somebody named Peter Brown, who is a Princeton retired. And he went to, I, we, we organized for him a trip to Bahia, Salvador, which is the epicenter for, for uh, Afro-Brazilian rights. And he attended one of these events and he came out and said it, it was like, like Greek drama. It was like the catalyst that most had been created in the Greek theater when you saw Oedipus Rex or, or one of these other things. So no, the, the, the natives uh, in New Mexico had nothing to do with witchcraft because you know, the way of doing the thing, but that's the way in which we conquer and impose our will on others. Good, is there anyone else? I is think Bill Pollock is, is raising his hand and waving at me and... Okay. So many, 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 many women were killed, but not all women were killed. Was it random who was put in that status and killed? Or were there, some, were there some differentiating things that differentiated those who were caught up in it and those who were not? This, this refers to Amanda's previous question. Most of the women who are killed come from a very specific social group, the lower rural society, not the ultra poor, because ultra poor doesn't call attention, they are so destitute that they are invisible. But women of a certain social class, certain age, who live by themselves, who have no husband or any male on top of them, who practice herbal law, who are midwives, that's the, the core of the people who get killed. Then and now, if you are of the upper classes, it will never happen to you. You will never be accused of witchcraft any more than you will be accused of any other thing. That is to say that there are in the early modern period as there is today, different systems of justice that are really related to your wealth, social position and the like. So the women are all, it's a very homogeneous group and the Essex Aziz is a, is a kind of sample of how this group looks. 
Anyone else? It's it's now just a couple of minutes past nine, so I think this is a good good time uh, for us to say uh, uh, for some of you, such as uh, Bill, who just spoke from Iowa. It's later than that. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Teo, uh, so very much uh, for um, uh, just a really uh, enjoyable and informative and stimulating lecture. Um, uh, a few of you or some of you will be in uh, Teo's seminar on Saturday and- uh, You have to work that seminar. Yeah. I am not doing any work. I'm just sitting there and allowing everybody to talk. That's exactly, though that's, that's not quite exactly the idea, but it's close to the idea. Um, and if not, I fail you. <laughs> uh, yeah, if only you had that power, uh, um, but uh, you won't need it. Uh, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Uh, uh, the rest of you, um, uh, come and uh, join us uh, two weeks from tonight uh, with Calvin Normore uh, with a parentheses very uh, short history of uh, natural rights. And uh, thank you all for being with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Great Thanks. talk, Theo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you.